Principles of design. That's what we're working on today. Um, principles of design pertain to the entirety of a piece of work, a subject. In this instance, it's a uh, Pacific Northwestern Coast Native American uh, garb of some sort. Um, and balance is, you know, defined as something that creates an equal mass on both sides, whether it be symmetrically, as you see in this instance. And uh, the other option is asymmetrically, where you have different scales of things on one side to the other that still manage to do a balance when you think in terms of the positive and negative spatial relationships. And we'll get into that in a minute. So in this instance, we've got symmetry, and it's defined as a quality of a composition or form wherein a precise correspondence of elements exists on either side of a center axis or point. Okay, that's the first element under balance is symmetry. And we've got the second subcategory is asymmetry. And in this instance, you've got one small subject surrounded by a bunch of negative space, and you've got the opposite on this side. And therefore, you've got a bunch of subject matter and very limited negative space. So you're getting a juxtaposition. You get the opposite situation happening where it becomes a symmetric or an asymmetrical balance because of this relationship. Another thing that comes to mind is the um, yin-yang symbol. Now, principles. Why are principles important? Principles pertain to the overall piece. In this instance, it's an advertising poster, or in this instance, it looks like it's a web page. And principles um, pertain to the overall fundamental soundness of your artwork, your composition, whether it be designing a car. There's a balance to a car design. There's balance to a poster, balance to a page layout. Um, Etc. Uh, Etc. Et so, in this instance, we've got the next principle of design we're going to focus on is emphasis. And in this instance, you've got emphasis, and it's defined as special importance, significance, or stress. In this instance, it's a poster or a web page that's advertised in the Ghost Rider movie that came out way back when. And you can see that the Ghost Rider is the only figurative, or in other words, realistic looking human being form to some degree. And as a result of that, he's being emphasized in all the space, okay? The fact is, is that you will get to the point where you understand how you use the elements of design to attain principal soundness. We'll get to the elements of design later. We've got seven words or terms for that. So if I want to establish emphasis in this instance, I would go to my toolbox of elements and I'd say, okay, I'm going to use size of the character to take up space so that he's emphasized. I would go with value because of the high value contrast of almost white versus the gray and the black in this instance. Shape because it's an unusual shape compared to everything else in this. That would be another way that you're able to utilize emphasis in this instance. And texture because you've got leather, smooth, shiny texture, and uh, also the fire, but the metal that's also reflecting off of these spikes. Okay, there's a lot of texture, not tactile texture, but visual texture. So that's the emphasis principle number two. In this instance, you've got size. Emphasis is on this big box because of high contrast and size. Okay, so that's how you attain it here. And also this deity or what would you call that? Some sort of an, um, I don't know, some sort of a nature spirit and how it contrasts and compares in size to this one makes it the emphatic focal point. You get the color on this one, Franz Marx painting. Um, and you get a bright yellow cow and color is just everywhere. So this, I would say that yellow is the hottest, highest value, uh, warm tone in this whole thing. This egg or rock seems to draw a lot of attention based on the fact that it's the highest contrast. So, you know, I'm not sure that that would be, um, that might be just something he's doing to upset the apple cart, so to speak. But the emphasis is clearly on the, the yellow lion. Yellow cow, that's what that is. Okay, then you've got high contrast. You've got white on black. High value contrast, emphasizing the fact that this is Frankenstein. It's also the fact that you've got black um, versus a white head shape. Also figurative shape here, figurative shape here, and a bunch of negative space. So that's drawing attention to based on the shape and also the texture that you're seeing as well. An unusual shape. You got a blimp eyeball. Um, 
unusual shapes tend to draw attention. Center placement. A friend of mine in the college uh, system asked me to paint this for him because he was the dean. And this was painted so big that he would have it behind his desk. And when he was behind his desk, his head would be right here. So he liked to uh, scare his the people that came into his office. <laughs> Center placement. Isolation emphasis is one of my favorite things. These buttons are isolated in this big black area up here. The type is isolated in this area right here. And then Caroline or Coraline is emphasized in this negative space here. You could also get as simplistic as um, a black page with a white dot on it. That white dot would be isolation emphasis. You might have seen instances where you have um, left turn sign, left turn sign, left turn sign, left turn sign, and then you have another sign at the very bottom that does this, you know, a loop-de-loop, -loop, draws attention to it because it broke up that flow and it was different. It was isolated. Placement. So we got placement in this one. So the moon is high contrast. It's big. It's textural. It's a perfect spot to highlight. Um, something that you want to emphasize in this instance, it's... Uh, Elliot and uh, E.T. Okay, emphasizing the whole over its parts. This is everything is emphasized and it's implying like you're going through some sort of a whirlpool of sorts. So everything being emphasized at once, all jumping out simultaneously. And then this is another one that I really like to cover. This is clearly the emphasis focal point right here. They're engaging each other. Um, I can go into this and say that these are both forming line. Their eyes are giving you a psychic line. Um, but the most important thing about this is that we're talking about the accents. The accents are what go on in the background to create um, a nice depth of field and an overall narrative for this particular piece that's got a rhythm and a flow to it as well as just emphasis. We're emphasizing this right here. These guys are here taking up space so that this wouldn't be a uh, bottom heavy composition. So balance is also helped by them being up there. And the fact that you're getting diminution or the root word diminish, the same repetitive size getting further away in space, showing a vastness of the space in the area, but also the fact that you're losing textual continuity from the foreground where it's crisp and clean detail to where it's becoming just really hazy and obscure. The accents, peripheral emphasis points is synonymous. Additional focal points of lesser degrees. Emphasis broken down in is contrast in shape, size, value, color, isolation, curvilinear versus rectilinear form. Absence of a focal point, such as a pattern on a garment, might also be accents. Going on to rhythm. Principle of design based on the repetition of recurrent motifs. In this instance, you've got lines, and you've got triangle line, triangle line, triangle line. This is actually an alternative or an alternating rhythm. We'll get into that in a moment. Legato rhythm where you've got nice curvilinear rolling hills that make you feel comfortable and it's taken from the musical term. So classical music would be an example of legato rhythm where it just flows nicely and it's comforting and relaxing. And then we get to the opposite side of the spectrum. We get to the other musical term, staccato, which is short and truncated. And in this instance, he's got um, a mosaic going. This is a work, I believe, by Gaudi in Spain. Abrupt changes, dynamic contrast within the visual rhythm. Okay, then we have alternating rhythm. In this instance, it's an airplane, negative space, airplane, negative space, airplane. Type, negative space, type, negative space, type. This isn't as uniform as it is up here, but it's still an alternating rhythm. A rhythm consists of successive patterns in which the sum or the same elements reappear in a rec regular order. The motifs alternate consistently with one another to produce a regular and anticipated sequence, portions in a composition. This also might be a light pole on a wire and a light pole on a wire, etc. This is one that I don't normally co uh, cover, but I think it's a very important one now that I've be been reintroduced to it. Progressive rhythm, large and small scale together, juxtaposition, Wiesner's veggies in the air. This is a children's book by David Wiesner. You guys might want to look it up. I can't recall the name of it right now, but... It's just a surreal book where people are going about their daily lives not realizing that huge vegetables are floating over their heads. It's an interesting story. <laughs> so this is pertaining to the small stars and then the big stars and showing that same kind of a depth of field, progressive rhythm that you had with the earlier instance with the elf.
Okay, the last principle, there's four. Principles are balance, emphasis, rhythm, and now unity. Unity is defined as the degree or, or of agreement existing among the elements in a design. How is this one unified? You could say that the colors are limited palette. You've got this green and you got this orange and you got shades of the orange where you just add black, etc., and white. Okay, so you've got orange, green, black, white, and uh, that's about it. So unity based on a limited color palette. Also, the shapes, the shapes that are getting you to go through the composition. This is also an alternating rhythm here, but it's also unifying the entire circle. And if it were on this side, not on this side, balance would be upset. So you see how these all interact to achieve a soundness and uh, an overall cohesion. Okay, unity, repetition. In this instance, the Acropolis has got color, shapes, and value that all make this unified throughout. If this were pink, that would ruin the entire unity. Emphasis would be upset as well. Okay, unity, because these this uh, pod of Orca are in close proximity, they're unified, therefore unity is attained in this particular image. And also the fact that they're patterning and their coloration and the negative space in their environment creating these blue accents are also unifying the piece. Limited color palette, shape, proximity also. Okay, again, this is a grid system that's used in magazines. And it's a two-column grid, and so the way that you get people to understand that the article is multiple pages long is you would unify through the basis of color in this instance. The color for these initial sentences, that's an orange. You've got the sepia tones, and you've got these two-column grids with the same footer and the same typographic treatment here. If this were more than one page, you turn the page, it's still got a two-column grid, same color situation, the same uh, photographic uh, style that's employed, then it's going to be something that evidently will show you that this relates to the last one. Therefore, this is the same article. Continuity. Okay. And that's it. So again, once you guys know the principles of design, we'll get to the elements of design, which are seven terms that are the toolbox that help you to attain Principle soundness, and if you have principle soundness, you have a comfortable image that's fundamentally sound that people can look at, and if they want, they can tweak it, but you can't go wrong. It's, um, it's good design, and uh, that's what we're looking for.